Welcome back to Cosmic Comics. Today I'm going to take a look at Captain Marvel Volume 1, Issues 41 through 46, published in 1975 through 1976. The first five issues are written by Steve Englehart and Al Milgram, with Chris Claremont getting credited for the final issue, but plots were done by Englehart and Milgram. Pencils throughout this run are done by Al Milgram. As we saw following the Trial of the Watcher, link above, Marvel and Rick Jones are finally capable of separating from one another. It didn't take long for Rick to discover that the music industry can be harder than one thinks. So he caught up to Marvel, who had stopped in at Cape Canaveral to say goodbye to Carol Danvers before leaving Earth. This brings us to the moment at hand. Captain Marvel has ended his mission to Earth and is returning to the Kree homeworld of Hala to take care of business with the Supreme Intelligence. In order to cover the vast distance between Earth and Hala, Marvel somehow gains access to a Quinjet which he modifies for space travel. I feel certain the Avengers would love to have those designs passed over to them. Surprisingly, it appears as though Marvel is arriving on Hala to report for duty once more. He says as much, reporting to the Supreme Intelligence, taking my place as a Kree once more instead of a Neo-Terran. Marvel exits his ship in order to avoid Hala's ring of protection. It very much gives the impression that Marvel is sneaking into Hala, odd for somebody reporting for duty. As he leaves, Marvel has the Quinjet return under automatic control, but is it returning to the Avengers? And in a move that would have made Felix Baumgartner proud, Marvel dives in towards the planet below. Again, Marvel seems happy, proud even, to be returning home as he remarks upon Hala, a world whose entire surface is covered in machinery, and the only thing that grows is power. As soon as Marvel touches the ground, Rick Jones is griping about wanting to split. Literally. Rick and Marvel pull apart once more, a transition that keeps getting easier with every success. After they split off, Rick's ever-persistent ego insists that he and Marvel aren't in a hurry and that Marvel should give him a tour of his new home. Rick is also worried about the natives not being friendly, but Marvel insists that, having been honored by the Supreme Intelligence, Rick won't have any trouble. Marvel begins by pointing out the Supreme Intelligence's tower chambers and begins to inform Rick about Hala as they walk in that direction. First thing Rick wants to know about is Hala's completely metal Cybertron-style surface. Marvel points out then, when you grow up in such surroundings, it doesn't seem so crazy, but he suspects it has something to do with his people's hatred of the Kotati. As they walk, Rick points out a religious structure, which he thinks looks like a Taco Bell. And Marvel informs Rick that it is a temple for the Universal Church of Truth. Of note, in Warlock, Volume 1, Issue Number 11, the church is stripped from history, so eventually this encounter never takes place. Weird. Rick and Marvel are manhandled by a member of the church, who attempts to forcibly offer our heroes some religious instruction. Rick turns the big guy down, pushing his hand off of his shoulder. As they walk away, Rick wants to know who that was, and Marvel explains that he is one of the church's warriors known as Black Knights. As they continue to walk away, Rick thumbs the gathering crowd, wondering if the locals are as friendly as Marvel said, especially after one shouts to kill them. Marvel attempts to pull rank, insisting that he's here under the protection of the Supreme Intelligence. But the crowd could care less. These guys are sick of something called the Green Priest, Supremor, and most of all, Pinks. Marvel notes that his half-breed heritage is going to be a problem again. And you have to love Marvel turning to Rick and pointing out, as a full-blooded human, that's even worse to these bigots. Marvel talks a big game, claiming he could beat them all, and he probably could. But instead, he grabs Rick's wrist and takes to the skies. 
Once in the air, Rick remarks that Marvel seems as out of touch with his world as Rick does with his own. I would say that this isn't the case, but who am I to judge as Marvel himself agrees with Rick's assessments? Additionally, Marvel is worried that his business may be urgent if most of the general population agrees with those they just encountered. Marvel and Rick Jones fly to the entrance of the Hall of Judgment. The portal slides to the side, and both are beckoned to enter. The Supreme Intelligence has been expecting them. Marvel admits that it was the Supreme Intelligence's intervention in Rick's battle against Annihilus that brought Marvel to Hala. For more on that, check out the link above. Rick interrupts, deciding to be the bearer of bad news, but the Supreme Intelligence doubts that Rick could know anything that would be news to one who is the undisputed ruler of a thousand worlds. Marvel challenges that boast, pointing out that once more, there are Kree who plot against the Supreme Intelligence and his policies of racial integration. Rick feels certain that Zarek and the rest of the Lunatic Legion are to blame. Marvel explains the Lunatic Legion escaped once he and Rick became involved with the Watcher. Again, links above. Rick starts sweet-talking the Supreme Intelligence, saying that because Big Green has been so good to them in the past, they felt the need to warn him. Supremor asks them to continue, but Marvel insists that's it. He's let the head boss know about the insurrection. Now, send out your goons and sweep them up. Supremor, always full of surprises, lets Marvel know he already knows where they all are. A shocked Marvel turns around to discover that the Lunatic Legion is right behind him. Srohim and Zarek take a moment to relish in Marvel's utter bewilderment at this revelation. Marvel truly doesn't understand what is going on, and I have to say as a reader, this move comes as a shocking surprise. The last time we saw the Lunatic Legion was on the moon, where they swore to be the enemies of the Supreme Intelligence. Marvel and Rick know what they have to do, or at least what Rick needs to do, and the two combine into a single body. One might think that Rick Jones doesn't add all that much to the equation, but no, no, no. Marvel was already one of the most powerful men time has ever known, with the additional might and mind of an ordinary Terran such as Rick Jones. Marvel becomes more than twice as good. Rick Jones enters Marvel's system like a drug. Marvel begins racing around the Hall of Judgment, beating down blue skin Cree on all sides. As he flies in and attacks their leader, Zarek complains that they were promised Marvel's defeat. He attempts to call for his allies to regroup, but it's too late. Marvel lays down a devastating blow. Supremor congratulates Marvel on both his victory and his improvement, calling the losers of the conflict fools while complaining about never knowing who to trust. Marvel isn't happy with this turn of events, and calls Supremor out for making multiple attempts on his life, but Supremor denies this, claiming to have only played a part in the most recent attack, a situation in which he assumed Marvel was never in any real danger. Supremor goes on to explain that the Lunatic Legion believed that they had masked their previous attempts on Marvel's life from Supremor, and thus were allowed to continue to serve him. Marvel, angered by Supremor's admission of helping his foes, wants to know why, as the two have always helped each other out in the past. Marvel reminds Supremor the reason why he wears his current uniform is as a special honor bestowed upon Marvel by Supremor following the first time Marvel stopped Zarek's schemes for power. Again, Link above. Supremor replies, first letting Marvel know that his title of greatest of all Kree warriors is more true today than on the day he received that title. Supremor claims Marvel's fatal weakness is, or was, a lack of personal ambition. Marvel would have been happy to spend his days climbing his way up through the military ranks, and Supremor had to prod Marvel out of that complacency. 
And here we are. I can't underestimate the importance of this page enough, as what transpires here has been hinted at from time to time, but being spelled out in such a manner redefines Marvel's character as a whole. I think it summed up best when Supremor states, I and I alone have clandestinely controlled your fate. Supremor tells Marvel that it was he who ensured that the love triangle of Marvel, Una, and Yon Rog was instigated by Supremor when he assigned all three of them to the same ship. We see more evidence of this in the future retcon and prequel to Marvel's first appearance, Captain Marvel The Untold Story. Supremor purposely sent Marvel to Earth because he knew Marvel would be sympathetic to its non blue masses. The seldom mentioned power increase Marvel received from Zarek and Ronan, the accuser, is also brought up here. This would have been when the two of them posed as the false god Zo and imparted special powers upon Marvel. Anyway, Supremor tells us he allowed Marvel to keep that power boost after their defeat. Supremor was also responsible for Marvel becoming stuck in the negative zone. We previously learned that Rick Jones quit the Avengers and took a bus out to the middle of the desert where he got off and then located the Negabands and that was due to Supremor telepathically prompting Rick to take those actions. All of this was part of an eventual plan that led to Supremor using Rick Jones' latent mental powers to unlock the Destiny Force, and then using said powers to end the Kree Skrull War. Supremor claims to have had the foresight to know that Marvel was destined to gain cosmic awareness upon becoming Eon's next protector of the universe. Supremor put all of this in motion, has been manipulating Marvel throughout his life to create this singular moment. Marvel has been forged into Supremor's perfect opponent. Marvel, not for the first time this issue, is confused. Why should he want to oppose that which he has always faithfully served? Then Supremor tells Marvel that the blue race of Kree have run their course. He continues by telling Marvel that he explained this to Rick Jones once already. We've previously established that Marvel has access to all of Rick's memories, so Marvel maybe should already know this or should at least be capable of remembering what Supremor tells him next. This quote comes straight from the end of the Kree Scroll War. Live a billion years. We will never advance one more rung up the ladder of evolution. Now the Kree can only hate the human race, which they subconsciously sense to be their superiors. And now for the new piece of the puzzle. Supremor is the sum of the Kree's greatest blue minds, and thus he feels that he has come to an end, unless... Unless he can assimilate Rick Jones' mind. It's still left somewhat unclear why Rick Jones' mind will solve Supremor's current dilemma. Supremor's plan can't easily be pulled off because he's incapable of directly absorbing a human mind. In order to do that, he needs the human mind to join with the mind of a non-blue Kree. I don't know if that was the original plan, but we just retconned so much of Marvel's history, and I kind of doubt that that was the plan from the very beginning when Stan Lee started writing Captain Marvel, but that was some mighty, mighty fine retconning there. That was retconning done right. Marvel wants to know why Supremor hasn't taken their minds yet. Why make Marvel so powerful, yet still make him an enemy? And I love, love, love Supremor's completely Cree answer, spoken like a true Cree. I am the sum of Cree minds, and the Cree love war. Yes, Supremor wants to fight Marvel, and to the victor, the stars. As far as Supremor is concerned, this is a win-win for him. Victory means he will continue without limits, but defeat means he was obsolete in the first place. And let's stop and consider the larger context of Marvel's life. Supremor personally oversaw Marvel's military career, 
set up Marvel to fall in love and then allowed the death of that woman, made Marvel an enemy of his own people and forced Marvel to become a vessel for a human host. Marvel was stuck in this situation where his only option to escape the negative zone was for a maximum of three hours and sometimes being trapped in there for months, which in the negative zone would have been years at a time. While Supremor uses that human host to tap into the destiny power, thus ending the Kree Scroll War, and now uses them both again as a prop against which to test his might. Marvel decides that he isn't fighting for the stars, he's fighting for his lost love, Una. Marvel recalls from the Kree Scroll War that the Supreme Intelligence doesn't have any defenses within the Hall of Judgment, but Supreme War shows that such oversights and security have since been rectified, as Marvel is struck. The entirety of the Hall of Judgment has been turned into a weapon, controlled by Supreme War's will, and echoing the time that Supreme War forced Marvel and Rick to change places, this time, he has torn the two asunder. Rick notes that nobody has ever done that with the Negabands. And Rick is surprised to discover that he is only wearing one of the two bands, while Marvel wears the other. All of this appears to play into some greater scheme the Supreme Intelligence has hatched, taunting our heroes by stating that they might not leave his presence alive, a very real threat considering the former traitor in Ursipur, Ronin, has been returned to his position of accuser. Supremor openly admits that Ronin has been steeping in hatred of those Supremor used to overthrow his and Zarek's coup. One might assume that Ronin is still working against the Supreme Intelligence, but Supremor insists that Ronin is completely under his power. Like a big, blue John Henry, Ronin comes in swinging with his hammer, and Marvel knows that he has to steer clear of it. Unfortunately, he's off his game at the moment. Even with his cosmic awareness, Marvel is having a hard time judging how strong he is with only one negaband. We can assume he is somewhere well under half the power he would have had while combined with Rick and both Negabands. Before Marvel can finish his thought, he's struck by Ronin's universal weapon. Despite what appeared to be a direct blow, Marvel flies into the air, claiming that he hasn't been harmed. If one ever doubted how much Marvel relies on the Negabands, we get some idea of that here. Marvel notes that while wearing one band, his energy replenishes slowly, implying that he's constantly using the Negabands as a well of sorts for extra energy. Marvel also appears to be limited in his output, complaining that he can't get enough speed before being hit by another blast from the Universal Weapon. Rick, Watching Marvel take a beating knows that something about the situation smells fishy. If Supremor wants to battle Marvel, then there is no way Supremor expects Ronin to win the battle. But Rick decides he can't wait to see how things play out. He needs to help his friend. So he runs in and knocks Ronin's knees out from under him. This is the distraction Marvel needs to finally land a blow on Ronin. As he lands the punch, we see him giving praises to Pama that Rick is a true friend. But Ronin is quick to point out that physical force is useless against him while getting a solid shot off on Marvel using his universal weapons, time motion displacement, to hold Marvel in place. Ronin then picks Rick Jones up by the back of his jacket. Rick, always being feisty, kicks Ronin's weapon from his hand. Disarming Ronin causes the displacement field on Marvel to dissipate, and in his anger, Ronin tosses Rick across the room in an attempt to kill him. Marvel, noting that Rick is going to die, instead of rushing in to save Rick, takes the opportunity to land a punch on Ronin, something Ronin had insisted is futile. And Rick, Flying towards the wall, seemingly has way too much time to talk, especially considering that he's already shouted, Holy Toledo! And at long last, Rick taps into the power of the Negabands. 
He brings himself to a stop in midair. As Rick lands, he notes the reason for this must be the ever-increasing oneness of his and Marvel's minds. Marvel continues landing blows on Ronan, amazed that he hadn't considered this possibility sooner. Marvel thinks that must be the reason for this battle, the reason Supremor gave a ban to both himself and Rick. Rick Jones comes flying in as Ronan reaches for his weapon. Marvel is too far away to stop Ronan, but Rick Jones isn't. Rick lands a flying left punch on Ronan. Rick follows it up with a right-hand hook, while Marvel goes for a kidney punch, if Kree even have kidneys. Marvel is impressed by Rick's increased strength, and Rick is starting to think he can take Ronan. But Supremor has had enough. He sends forth eye beams, forcing Marvel and Rick to pay attention to him, stating that he's seen all he wanted to see, while praising them both for being all he had hoped for. In the next panel, both have been whisked away to parts unknown. Ronan remains prone on the floor, and silence once again fills the Hall of Judgment. Phase 1 is complete. And then we get an interesting roadmap for this story arc, but the panels are out of order. The next issue will deal with the Prospector, followed by the Space Traveler in issue 43, Circuitry in issue 44, the Gem in issue 45, and finally, the Bloom in issue 46. After a month of waiting, the next issue allows us to finally catch up with Rick and Marvel two seconds after Supremor transported them away. As he did so, a prospector notices a glint of light on a distant asteroid. Reminds me of the end of last issue, when an ancient prospector spies a glint of light on a sharp outcropping. As for Rick and Marvel, both find themselves on a foreign body, breathing a poisonous atmosphere. In the writer's corner, we're promised a comic that will start fast and then shift into high gear. Both heroes struggle to breathe. Marvel clutches his throat and falls backward. As he collapses, he has to wonder, why? Why did the Supreme Intelligence send him here? For what purpose? And, and enter the Prospector. The old-timer loads them up on his mechanical mule. He's outfitted both Marvel and Rick with bubbles over their heads, just like his own. Some type of breathing apparatus. The Prospector is happy to see that Marvel is coming too, and as he does so, he refers to Marvel as Marshall. Marvel is more surprised to be alive than learn of his new title. The glint the old-timer saw on the first page of the issue, he thought was some thiamite, but instead, it was the light reflecting off of the negabands. The old prospector informs Marvel that there have been many problems with claim jumpers, and that he's happy that the marshal he sent for has already arrived albeit much sooner than he anticipated. Marvel points out that his name isn't Marshall, but he can't fool the prospector, who is quick to point out that Marvel has a star on his chest. As Marvel attempts to explain that he's a military captain, Rick Jones perks up and pipes in, betting that Supremor is behind whatever is going on here. While Rick was knocked out, he got the great idea to use the Negabands. Rick closes his eyes and concentrates on using the Negabands' power and does something amazing. He uses it to physically alter the atomic structure of his clothing and creates a new outfit out of scratch. What? Wow. I didn't know the Negabands could do that. Look out, Molecule Man. Even though it only lasts for a moment, Rick does temporarily call himself Marvel Boy, seemingly excited about taking on his new superhero persona. I'd say he literally just woke up and the first thing he wanted to do was make certain he looked the part of a superhero. Rick begins to collapse from using too much of the band's energy while claiming that Marvel Boy thing, that was just a joke and calling the name dumb. As Rick hangs off of Marvel, Marvel is shocked by what he just saw. Rick 
using the nega bands to change matter. Marvel also wonders what else the bands might be capable of. The prospector reminds them of the poison in the air and attempts to keep our heroes moving along while headed towards a distant dome. We get a little bit of a foreshadowing as the prospector notes the millennia bloom has just come into season, a plant that as its name suggests blooms only once every 1,000 years. Rick wants to know if Marvel has any idea where they are as they prepare to enter the dome through a door marked OK, but Marvel doesn't have a clue. Once inside, the prospector explains that the OK space station is a prefab arboreum. This is an obvious play on the OK Corral, as the place resembles an Old West town, and Rick loves it. And would any Western be complete without a bad attitude posse? A couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble in this neighborhood claiming that the prospector wasn't supposed to show his face around here again. The thugs, being thuggish, approach. The prospector is lifted into the air and tossed to the ground. Rick and Marvel fail to intervene, seemingly frozen in place as they fear anything could be a trap. But once the prospector, named Shabby, hits the ground, Marvel leaps into action. Marvel hits the thug so hard he lands on his back, skids across the ground, and knocks out a support post on the porch. We learn the angry young fella's name is Jake Morania, and he calls for his gang to get Marvel. Rick does a quick gut check with Marvel, pointing out that it wasn't ten minutes ago that they were fighting on Hala, and now they're in the middle of a cowboy street brawl. Marvel insists that they are ready, casting a little bit of shade in Rick's direction when he calls him untried, which is unfair because Rick has already held his own against Ronan. As annoying as Rick Jones can be sometimes, I have to admit that it's delightful to see him and Marvel working together as a unit to take these guys down. Are Englehart and Milgram getting me to like Rick Jones? Nah. Marvel and Rick appear to be making short work of their foes, but one of them calls for help and reinforcements come running out from every direction to assist with the fight. Marvel and Rick are back to back, facing an ever-growing crowd. Rick laments that Shabby said the town had some good folks. Marvel takes to the skies, telling Rick to remain calm. As Marvel grabs a column beam from the porch, he notes that based on the Old West theme, this scenario would have more significance to Rick, as it holds little for Marvel. But again, Marvel has access to Rick's memories. Marvel suspects what is on the line here is Rick Jones' mind. Marvel turns and begins using the fence post as a baseball bat to clear out his foes. While doing so, he laments that this moment, like every other moment in his life, is happening solely because the Supreme Intelligence placed Marvel in this moment, forcing Marvel's life to revolve around protecting one Earth boy in this singular moment. But he also recognizes that Rick may not feel like he needs Marvel's protection any longer. The prospector hoots and hollers, loving seeing Jake Marina's gang take a lickin'. Jake is tired of playing games and reaches into his vest and pulls forth a gun while the prospector calls for the marshal to look out. One might wonder why we haven't seen any guns until now, and it becomes clear when Jake says he doesn't like to shoot inside of the dome. They can't run the risk of destroying their pocket of clean air. Rick Jones is on the case, coming in with a couple of good blows reminding Jake not to forget about the marshal's deputy. Ah, Rick, ever the sidekick. Jake gets right back up, belittling Rick's punch, but Rick is ready to come in with something stronger if he needs to. But before he can do it, Jake is struck from behind by the prospector's mechanical mule, Rusty. One might have thought Jake ran the scene around here, but with him knocked out on the ground, Another gang member turns towards the two lawmen, admitting defeat, but letting them know that the big boss is going to be angry when he hears about today's events. 
Marvel says he's willing to take his chances and decides to hang on to Jake's pistol. Rick, Marvel, and Shabby all head over to the Red Dog Saloon, where Shabby insists on buying the drinks. Once seated inside, Shabby fills our heroes in on the history of the area. When the Kree took over Deneb 4 from the Scrolls, they took over around 100 asteroids. At first, it was no big deal. These asteroids weren't seen as having any great economic value. Until Smithy discovered Thiamite. The discovery led to an economic boom, not unlike the gold rushes of the American West. Once the engineers arrived, they set up buildings that filled the air with poison. Eventually, things got so bad that they had to put up the dome. It was at that time firearms were outlawed in order to ensure nobody cracked the Lamite enclosure. While this guy is sharing the area's history, Rick can't bother to pay attention and starts to wonder what else he can do with his newfound powers. Rick, who moments ago was content to be the sidekick, is already considering that he no longer needs to play second fiddle. But Rick gets distracted mid-thought as a woman in a nearly transparent pink dress passes by. Rick walks right up, noticing that he can see right through her. Meanwhile, Marvel and the Prospector have continued their conversation, but are interrupted by the sounds of a crowd gathering outside. Outside the saloon, Marvel discovers a very welcoming citizens' committee who appreciate what Marvel is attempting to do, but at the end of the day, they are more afraid of the big boss than they are of Marvel, so they are politely requesting that he leave town. Rick, as usual, is itching for a fight. He turns back towards his transparent friend, but she's gone. Rick checks in with Marvel, who explains that they have been asked to leave. Before Marvel makes a decision, he wants Shabby to give him the skinny on Big Boss, but Shabby admits to never having seen him around these parts. And all at once, the stranger burst in on the scene. We haven't seen the stranger since the conflict between himself and the Overmind in Fantastic Four Volume 1, Issue 116, Link to my discussion above. The very next page gives us Drax the Destroyer, whom we haven't seen since the Thanos War. Drax is flying through space, raging over Thanos. He destroys an asteroid while screaming Thanos' name. Back at the saloon, Marvel wants to know if the stranger is the one they call Big Boss. He lets Marvel know he is. He took on the role after running across what he calls a hamlet of madmen. But before we can learn anything more, the stranger wants to do a little role play. He and Marvel are going to have a gunfight. And if Marvel objects the stranger, he'll destroy the entire place. A very persuasive argument. Marvel, likely feeling the heat of a hot Rick Jones behind him, turns and instructs Rick to stay here and don't interfere. Once outside, Marvel and the Stranger face off in the street. Marvel tells the Stranger that it's his move and the Stranger calls for them both to draw. Marvel doesn't seem to know how a gunfight works, as he doesn't draw his gun while thinking that the Stranger doesn't have anything in his hand. The Stranger uses that same hand to fire a blast of energy at Marvel. Marvel refuses to fire his weapon while the stranger uses both hands to blast away towards Marvel. Again, in the fashion of many westerns, the stranger fires at Marvel's feet while calling for him to dance. Marvel doesn't want to fire his weapon because he's afraid of damaging the dome. At the same time, he recognizes that the only way he can overcome the stranger's mental attacks are with physical force. He attempts to dive in for a punch, and is rebuffed before he can come in close. Marvel's only option is to fly high and attempt to fire downward with his weapon. The stranger doesn't notice as the weapon's fire splashes across his chest. He turns to Marvel and says that he can't be affected by the weaponry of humanity, except it's not a 
human weapon. It came from one of the aliens here, but whatever. The stranger uses his mental powers to deflect Marvel's shot upwards towards the dome above. Upon impact, it cracks the Lamite surface and begins leaking poison. Rick Jones flies forth in an attempt to fix the situation. Although Marvel and the Stranger continue to fight, the townsfolk begin dropping to the ground at once from the noxious fumes. Rick, seeing the devastation below, knows that he has to get the dome to fuse together quickly. The Stranger continues to press his attack, calling for Marvel's surrender. Not understanding why Marvel would choose to inject himself into this experience, Marvel dives away thinking to himself that he had assumed the Stranger was another agent of Supremor, but if that's not the case... But before he can finish his thought, the Prospector calls out, pointing to Rick who is attempting to seal the dome. Up above, Rick is using the Negabands to weld the dome back together. Marvel, trusting Rick to handle things on that front, turns back to the Stranger. In that moment, something happens to the Prospector. He collapses. As he does so, the movement catches Marvel's eye, and he learns that he's not perfect. He's caught by a blast from the Stranger. Oddly, this seems to upset the Stranger, who cries out that he didn't intend to shoot Marvel in the back. With Marvel seemingly down for the count, the Stranger complains that Marvel has ruined his experience. What was a perfect place, filled with rustic inhabitants, crazed from breathing too many cycles of poisons and living a life of charade, Marvel seemingly ruined this microcosm of madness, and the Stranger chooses to depart, passing through the dome on his way out. Rick is shocked to note that the stranger didn't even cause so much as a ripple when he passed through the dome and with that rick has finished repairing the dome enough to stop any gas from leaking in and as he does so he notes that it took everything he had he can no longer keep himself in flight and begins falling marvel comes to in time to spot rick hurtling towards the earth he picks up the pace and catches his friend before he strikes the ground as they fly towards the ground, they are meted by a jubilant trio, the old prospector leading the cheers. Rick assumed the prospector was dead. Marvel explains that he was, but Marvel force-healed him, a trick he learned from his friend, Rick Jones. Once they land, the old-timer thanks our heroes for saving the space station. As they prepare to leave, Marvel is still looking for the unseen hand of Supremor, and surmises that it was most likely he who influenced the form of this fantasy world. While this is going on, the scantily clad girl in the pink dress calls out to Rick, beckoning him to come. Offering a reward for his effort, Rick assumes it's a kiss, closes his eyes, and leans in. Marvel calls out to Rick, who is upset at having his moment interrupted, only to discover that the woman has disappeared once more. Marvel has a space helmet ready for Rick and announces that he's made enough adjustments to Rusty that he should be capable of carrying them to Deneb 4. Marvel and the Prospector shake hands, saying goodbye. Marvel leads with an adios. This isn't something Marvel would have ever said on his own and shows that he and Rick's minds are beginning to bleed together. The heroes shout farewell, riding away on their silver steed, as one of the aliens ask, Say, Shabby, who was that masked man, anyhow? The most classic of Lone Ranger references. The next issue deals with the wayward space traveler, and begins with Marvel and Rick traveling through space on their way to Daneb 4. Along the way, Rick keeps repeating the same quote from the Cisco Kid, a western that ran the same time as the Lone Ranger throughout most of the 1950s. Marvel is starting to get annoyed by Rick and his pop culture references. Marvel then gives us his take on the current situation. The Supreme Intelligence sent the two of them, him and Rick, into the far reaches of space in order to wear them both down with Marvel as Rick's protector, but Rick takes issue with the protecting part, claiming that now that he has his own nega band, he no longer needs somebody looking out for him. 
Rick starts bragging about their recent accomplishments as a form of recap for the reader, but Marvel asks for him to quiet down upon hearing something far away. We switch back to Drax, who once again is ripping apart an asteroid, but that's not enough to quench his rage. He dives into a sun and somehow rips out its core, for he is the Destroyer. One might think that Marvel and Drax meeting was chance, but no. Lay such thoughts to rest. The Supreme Intelligence is still pulling the strings. Here we learn that Drax has been driven to near madness because he knows Thanos has risen as of Warlock issue number 9, but he hasn't been able to locate his target, and thus he travels through space, destroying everything he runs across. Just like Supreme War brought Marvel and Shabby together, he is now going to do the same thing with Marvel and Drax. In order to put his plan in motion, Supremor sends out some sort of mental burst to the space steed Rusty. Upon receiving this burst, the mule bucks Rick Jones. Marvel is capable of staying on the mule, but it continues bucking. Rick wants to know what's up, but Marvel isn't sure. Feeling certain the mule was in working order after his repairs and suspecting a rotted circuit. In order to work on the machine, Marvel takes her down to a nearby moon. Rick Jones, who insists on being infuriating to the reader, thinks to himself as he flies in that Marvel has finally taken a back seat to old Rick Jones. After all, Rick is the one Supremo really wants. A cocky Rick Jones decides to give his sidekick a compliment, telling him, Nice mule. When Marvel looks inside the machine, everything appears to be in order. Rick wants to know if Marvel can fix it, and this comment shows that the memories of Rick and Marvel are not necessarily a two-way street. If Rick had access to all of Marvel's memories, he might know how to fix it himself. Marvel makes the suggestion that the two of them could combine together and continue their journey that way, but Rick insists that he doesn't want to merge anymore now that they don't have to. I suspect Rick Jones might be afraid that merging together once more could mean he loses access to his half of the Negabands. Rick claims that he likes being Rick all the time. To which Marvel points out that this process that Rick is currently complaining about is the only reason we now even have a Super Rick Jones in the first place. When Rick asks what that is supposed to mean, Marvel digresses and says he's going to focus on getting Rusty repaired. Rick doesn't understand why they can't both fly on, side by side, together. Marvel insists that Rick isn't experienced enough with the Negabands and will run out of energy along the way. Rick is getting annoyed with Marvel's reality checks and leaves to go practice with his new toy. Rick, ever the bad sport, hopes Marvel gets covered in mule oil because he assumes Marvel doesn't want to share the spotlight with him, and this haughtiness and macho machismo could be due to some of Marvel's mind bleeding over into Rick's brain. Before Rick can continue his current line of thinking, something catches his eye. Again, Rick spies the woman who has disappeared on him twice already. He knows that she shouldn't be here, that where he saw her before, that took place on a different planet. Rick flies in to put on the moves, and once more the woman disappears as he approaches. Rick is beginning to catch on, comparing her to a will-o'-wisp, ignoring the negative connotations of such a thought. Rick continues after the woman. Meanwhile, Drax is still raging in space, complaining that he can't locate Thanos, but when he does, he'll rip his limbs from his body. It's then that Drax becomes aware of familiar vibrations nearby. Marvel, meanwhile, continues to find nothing wrong with the mule. As Drax draws closer, he recognizes that it's Marvel who is on the moon below him. Marvel thinks he hears a scream for a second time, but turns his attention back to his work, but prepared for anything. After all, he couldn't pinpoint the location due to the helmet he's wearing. Drax 
is zeroed in on Marvel. He plans to kill Marvel with a single punch, and you have to love the way Drax is coming in on this approach. Marvel's cosmic awareness saves his life, allowing him to dodge the punch, causing Drax to destroy Marvel's helmet. Marvel finds the air hard to breathe, but at least it isn't poisonous. Marvel doesn't have long to reflect as the Destroyer is still coming. Before Drax can land a blow, Marvel leaps to his feet, kicking Drax in the process and sending him hurtling backwards. As Marvel lands on his feet, he wants to know why Drax is doing this. The answer is simple. By killing Thanos, Marvel stole Drax's mission from him, an act that has left Drax feeling meaningless. And in typical comic book form, he wants to destroy Marvel for it. As the two clash, Marvel is impressed with Drax's power. He's stronger than Marvel, but Marvel is the faster of the two. As the battle rages, Marvel worries about Rick Jones and considers that he may already be dead. But he's not. Rick is chasing through the jungle after his ghost woman. He's found her once more, only instead of a pink dress, she now wears a bikini. She's giving Rick the eye and a sexy smile when he approaches. Rick is starting to wonder why she always looks so inviting, but keeps running away from him. He's also confused as to how she changed her clothes so fast. As he walks up, he lets her know that he appreciates playing hard to get, but he's hoping that she's going to sit still this time. Amazingly, she speaks English. She agrees not to flee and reaches forth, asking for Rick's hand. At that same moment, Drax grabs Marvel's wrist. But Marvel puts Drax in his place, pointing out the difference between the two. Drax has power, but Marvel possesses skill, reason, and more. Marvel lands a solid one-two between a punch and a kick, dropping Drax to the ground. Marvel turns his back on his one-time ally, claiming no responsibility for his current state, while at the same time admitting that he knew when he killed Thanos that this is the fate that would befall Drax. But in that moment, it was Thanos or Marvel, and Marvel is the protector of the universe. Or Drax? It could have been Drax. As Drax insists that it could have been him, as he lifts himself up off the ground, Marvel is shocked, wondering aloud what it will take to stop Drax. Drax tells him nothing. Nothing can stop him. Drax explains that when Marvel destroyed Thanos, he also destroyed Drax. Drax's entire argument is that Drax should have been the one to kill Thanos. And anybody who stopped that from happening needs to die. You got to love Marvel's response. I don't want to fight you. Be reasonable, man. And Drax's response is just as good. He has no reason and admits as much. All Drax has is power, nothing else. And with that, he lands a tremendous blow upon Marvel. As Marvel pulls himself from the rubble, he thinks to himself that he doesn't want to kill Drax, but is starting to realize it's something he might have to do. Drax doesn't relent, striking Marvel with an energy blast from his fist. He notes that Marvel is not as strong as Thanos, and since Thanos would have fallen to Drax, logically, Marvel should also fall to Drax. But let's use that same reasoning against Drax. Thanos beat Drax twice during the Thanos War, and Marvel has beaten Thanos. This is why Drax doesn't use reasoning. He's not very good at it. As Marvel flies away, Drax pursues him. As Marvel flees, he can tell that Drax is closing in. Each blast is closer and stronger than the one before. He's not going to be capable of outrunning him. Instead, he'll have to turn and face Drax. As he does so, he punches an asteroid, which Drax easily rebuffs. The attack is so pitiful that we're told that the Destroyer would laugh if it were in his nature. So this Drax is notably different from the cinematic version. Drax catches Marvel with a blast and then grabs onto our hero's ankle. He then starts slamming Marvel into the asteroids like a ragdoll. Marvel admits that he can't take much more of this. Again, Drax slams Marvel. And moments like this in a comic are great. I love that the action slows down here to show us a scared Captain Marvel. The rubble 
bobs around Marvel's battered head, spinning in the near weightless void. Inside his head, the same void holds true. He's no Superman. He's aware, yes, skilled, strong, but he's not invulnerable. And as the Destroyer drags him backwards one more time, Marvel knows that he's reached the end of his endurance. And let's not gloss over that Marvel, that character with the same name as the comics company, just used the term Superman in a Marvel comic. And when he did it, it was to point out that he is no Superman. He is not invincible. As this is going down, Rick is busy snuggling. He, he wants to know her name, and she's surprised that he hasn't guessed it, Fawn. Rick isn't sure why he should know that, and she offers to tell him, maybe, if he removes his helmet. Rick knows that he might die if he removes his helmet, and he lets her know that he's not sure he can do that. As her top starts to come off, she tells Rick, he's no fun. Rick, ever the charmer, promises to show her how much fun he is if she promises not to disappear anymore. As he says this, she takes off at a playful run, and Rick Jones feels a flutter in his heart that he hasn't felt for, what, just over a week? For the first time since breaking up with Luann, Rick thinks he might be in love. Or something else. Whatever it is, it feels good. In an undeniably creepy, creeper panel, Rick leaps forward and catches Fawn by her ankle. This shot appears to echo Drax grasping at Marvel's ankle a couple of pages prior. Rick, after taking her to the ground, takes her hand, reflecting that this woman is both innocent and deep. But she refuses to come any closer until Rick removes his helmet. Rick plans to use his negaband to help him breathe if needed and decides to try it out. Almost immediately, he doubles over. Out in space, Drax has defeated Marvel. All that's left is to destroy him. Drax plans on Marvel burning up while re-entering the atmosphere of the moon below. He winds Marvel up and tosses him towards the moon. And wow. We are at the halfway point in this arc, and things are looking bad for both Rick and Marvel. Issue 44, represented by the circuitry from the prologue, opens with Marvel burning up upon re-entry into the moon's atmosphere. At the same time, Rick Jones has collapsed after removing his helmet. He calls out to Fawn to help him, but instead, she turns and runs. Rick lies on the ground, crying, thinking he's going to die, and thinking he almost loved her. As Marvel hurls towards the moon, he looks for solutions. The negaband. Marvel again follows Rick's lead, drawing extra strength from the band and slowing his descent. Marvel is amazed at the power at his disposal, untapped. He can halt his fall, replenish his vitality, and put an end to the Destroyer once and for all. Drawing upon this newfound well of power, Marvel feels as though he can do anything. From afar, the Supreme Intelligence watches events unfold, complaining that it's taking Marvel and Rick Jones far too long to fight their way back to him. He has yet unrevealed reasons why he needs them to return on a schedule. As Marvel dives into battle with the Destroyer once more, Supremor admits that it was he who drew the combatants together, but it was never supposed to interfere with the next event. In order to speed things up, Supremor repairs whatever he broke inside of Rusty the Mule. As we switch back over to Marvel, we see him using his newfound power to pummel Drax. Meanwhile, Supremor narrates, letting us know that it was his plan all along for Marvel to find the power, to draw upon the power, doing always as Supremor desires. With things on the moon in Marvel's control, Supremor turns his attention towards his preparations on Deneb 4. Marvel and Drax are going at each other full throttle. Although Drax appears to be softening as he admits that destroying Thanos might be simpler than finishing off Marvel. And we are pretty much back to where we were most of last issue. 
Drax attempting to kill Marvel for killing Thanos, and Marvel using the same excuse, it was Thanos or myself, and this response is so great, so Marvel. I am a Creed trained soldier who had his powers heightened by a god, and who now controls unlimited energy through a single shining wristband. Okay, that was great right up until the end, but you have to love this panel of the Nega Band. After all this time, they have finally come front and center to the story, and again, Marvel leaps into the fray, Drax bewildered by his once nearly dead foe, Marvel comes in with a punch exclaiming that 99 and a half won't get it. And I don't get it as he gets the quote wrong. The song or lyric is 99 and a half won't do, but perhaps the Rick Jones memories flooding Marvel's mind are imperfect. Marvel, in a moment of aggression, turns away from his protector role and taps into his warrior past. Whatever is going on here, Marvel grabs Drax by the ankle. Turn about as fair play as Marvel unleashes the same fate Drax met upon Marvel, tossing Drax towards the moon to burn up upon re-entry into the atmosphere. And if there was any question behind Marvel's intent, we get a very loud, Die, Destroyer! Marvel continues to lose his cool. He's pissed off. Afraid that he might seem like an easy mark after having to babysit Rick for so long. All of these catchphrases and outbursts of anger. Something is amiss. This isn't Marvel's normal way of handling things. He dives toward the moon and the reader is clued in that they should have been clued in that something is off with Marvel. With the increased anger issues and the constant use of catchphrases, I'm going to say that this is a sign of Marvel and Rick's continued merging. Rick's temper and pop culture references are begin to carry over to Marvel's mind. And of course, the Destroyer isn't destroyed. As he brings himself to a halt, he spies Fawn running down below. Drax desires to pay her no mind, landing and then raising his fist towards Marvel. As Fawn reaches out, Drax demands that she back off by the dark god of hate. And we can tell by the sparkles around Drax's face that she has put forth some kind of bewitching as she says, you know what you must do for me. She then gives Drax a this is your life panel where he sees his life as real estate agent Art Douglas and the car crash that led to his death and eventual rebirth as Drax. A crash his daughter survived, eventually becoming Moon Dragon. Drax is shown he stopped living the night of the crash. Since then, he's been dead. And then he's shown Rick Jones, whom he can sense is close to death. And moreover, he knows why. And Fawn insists that he knows more than that, referring to him as Art Douglas. The only thing I don't like about this is all of this is put forward as a revelation, but... All of this was revealed to Drax by Thanos during the Thanos Wars story arc. And then Drax gets the revelation he desires. He knows where Thanos is. But before he can leave, Marvel arrives once more, ready to finish his battle with the Destroyer. Drax, filled with purpose once more, calls for silence, warning Marvel that such talk is immature while Rick lies dying and Thanos lives again. He then takes to the skies leaving Marvel with the mysterious woman whom Drax compares to his daughter. But Marvel, for whatever reason, still can't see Fawn. Even so, she can affect him. She reaches out, and suddenly Marvel can sense Rick Jones in trouble, and just like Drax, he can also sense why. Marvel is cognizant of the fact that he doesn't know how he suddenly knows this information. Man, if only he had some kind of super awareness he could tap into. Marvel finds Rick where he knew he would be, and we learn that Rick wasn't at fault for removing his helmet, as the Negabands are capable of allowing Rick to breathe the atmosphere. Rick's collapse was from Marvel drawing too heavily upon his Negaband. Doing so drew energy away from Rick, causing him to collapse. Marvel goes ahead and returns what life force he can to Rick, but following the harsh beatdown given to him by the Destroyer, he doesn't have enough spare energy to save Rick, 
In order to save his friend's life, Marvel will have to reach Danib 4. Marvel worries that perhaps he's already shared too much energy with Rick. He's going to have to stop flying or he's going to pass out. As he approaches Rusty, Marvel's mind is cloudy and he finds it hard to think. He places Rusty's head back on and is glad to see the mule seems to be back in working order. Rick and Marvel leave on what is dubbed the mule who jumped over the moon. If I ever lived to see such a sight. As Marvel and Rick close in on Deneb 4, the narrator tells us that Supremor had expected Marvel to defeat Drax before leaving, but that didn't happen. Now, a second unexpected event has occurred that wasn't part of the Supreme Intelligence's plan. Deneb 4 has been destroyed. As they ride in, Marvel wonders aloud what, what else could go wrong, and that's when Rusty finally gives out. Fortunately, Marvel has enough strength remaining to carry himself and Rick Jones to the surface. The first thing Marvel does is locate the central medical facility and places Rick inside a standardized life support chamber. Marvel is confused as he flies through the city. Everywhere he goes, there isn't any sign of life. Until outside the city, sprawling over the countryside, he spies Noltrons. Ancient Kree weapons that were outlawed when the Supreme Intelligence rose to power because their only function is to punish those who transgress against the Empire. But that's not their sole purpose. The Nultrons move faster than Marvel was expecting, grabbing Marvel with one hand and calling him a human, even though he's a Kree and he's wearing his military uniform. In this moment, all the grander stories that are taking place around Marvel mean nothing. Everything comes down to this one do-or-die moment, the moment in which Marvel chooses to fight. Marvel breaks free, claiming that he couldn't be held, and the Noltrons have a nice retort, pointing out that he considers animated matter repellent and wouldn't want to hold on to Marvel. And here we see the real purpose behind the Noltrons, and probably the reason they were outlawed. They want to render all life inanimate. As Marvel reaches about, he realizes that they have successfully scorched all of Daneb 4. Even the ground has been raised. Marvel has at least five Noltrons closing in on him, but he doesn't dare summon energy from the Negabands until he knows that Rick is safe. As Marvel flees the scene, he blames his current predicament upon Supremor and thinks to himself that if he and Rick can ever find a moment of peace, they need to come up with a good counterattack. Fortunately, at least one of the Noltrons stops to destroy some plant matter. At the same time, another points to the life form hovering near the Kree man. Again, Marvel turns and sees nothing. Again, she reaches forth and touches Marvel, this time noting how far in the dark Marvel is. It appears as though she recharged Marvel because he suddenly has his strength back. What he calls his second wind, Marvel returns to the hospital to strategize with Rick and is shocked to discover that Rick is gone. Marvel is concerned since everybody else in the city is dead. His cosmic awareness raises awareness of another threat. He turns and in disbelief is tossed back by a half dozen robots. Their blows are hurting Marvel and as he attempts to fight, but he's seen video scans of battle fatigue. Marvel knows that a man can get lost on the battlefield. Despite the best training, he can lose his edge and begin to flail until their fighting becomes mechanical. And in the end, Marvel gives in to darkness. But Marvel isn't dead and can still walk, and, and they lead him half-conscious somewhere. Marvel wonders if it might be to his death, but he knows that Supremor wants him alive, or does he? As they step into the light and Marvel sees Rick Jones, he shakes the cobwebs from his mind. A voice calls out, asking Marvel to calm himself and claiming that Rick remains unharmed. Marvel thinks it's a Noltron speaking to him, but what we get is something far more bizarre. We get a Noltron with a head attached to it. He introduces himself as the head of the underground fighting against the Noltrons and calls upon Marvel and Rick to lead them. In return, he'll cure Marvel and Rick of their shared disease. 
Marvel has no idea what disease the talking head is talking about. The head then asks Marvel if he hasn't realized that he and Rick's minds are merging into one, and there we have it. There has been a long build-up to this, but there is finally a light at the end of the tunnel for Marvel and Rick to become disentangled. Issue number 45 is the gem from the prologue. And from this opening page, I'm going to say that this is most likely the oddest comic printed this month. And the comic is dated, as the issue is named after the 1976 bicentennial anniversary of the United States. The new, strange-looking creature points out that Marvel has been beaten nearly to death, while Rick is already comatose. If Marvel doesn't listen to this guy, he's doomed. In the center of this panel sits a giant gem. Marvel wants to know why a Noltron would fight his fellow Noltrons. The head explains that he used to be a cyborg until his throat was cut in combat. In order to preserve their fallen foe, his allies grafted his head onto the circuits of a fallen Noltron. For some reason, since that day, he served as their general. The war on Deneb 4 has gone horribly. Almost everything on the planet is dead, so these robots who fetched Marvel earlier, turns out those aren't robots, they're cyborgs. People who have gradually lost their limbs and then had them replaced with cybernetics until they are almost entirely machine. Their only hope for survival is Captain Marvel and Rick Jones. Marvel wants to know what's up with the giant gem, but he has to agree to help the head before he's allowed to learn anything about it. Marvel takes a moment to think things over. His thinking is part recap and part tying the pieces together. Looking back at the events that have unfolded, none of it makes any sense to Marvel. All he can be sure of is that all this comes down to him and Rick. It always has, ever since the Supreme Intelligence forced them to become dependent on one another. Over time, both he and Rick have become stronger and their bodies drawn ever closer together. Marvel had been at the peak of his powers before Supremor gave one of the Negabands to Rick Jones. Supremor then sent Marvel and Rick on a tumultuous journey that has slowly weakened both of them. The weaker they get, the more they need each other. And the more they need each other, the faster their minds meld. If their identities merge, neither Captain Marvel or Rick Jones will come out the other side. Whatever comes out the other side, their individual identities would be no more than memories and easy prey for Supremor. Marvel knows that he can't let that happen, so he's made up his mind. Marvel is ready to assist the head. Once he announces his intentions, he's asked to approach the gym. And here it is. Cosmic Comics takes its first step towards the Infinity Gauntlet. Of note, the concept is so new that the head states that there are six soul gems. Eventually, only one of the gems will be referred to as the soul gem. But of note, the head does mention that each of the six gems has a different power, but also states that each of them are all equally effective on the mind. At this point in time, a second soul gem is known to be in the possession of Adam Warlock. The head claims to know nothing of the other stones. Not all of the information the head gives us is accurate. We should take everything he says with a grain of salt and note that he's telling us what he knows about the gem from his perspective. He's not an authoritative source on the Infinity Stones. This, despite the purplish-pink appearance, is the Mind Stone, which will eventually settle into the Yellow Infinity Stone. Marvel steps forth to place his hands on the gem, but pauses. Marvel isn't quite sure what to do, warning the head that if this requires concentration, he might be at a loss, but... Marvel is assured that he needn't worry about anything so ordinary. Marvel is shocked to see that Rick is being removed from his life support chamber. Marvel protests this based on Rick's current condition. He's assured by the head that Rick will be fine. He's 
suffering from a mental deficiency, not a physical one. They need the gym in order to cure Rick's mind. The possibly still unconscious Rick Jones is hurled headfirst into the gym while the head calls for Marvel to follow him. Marvel thinks about turning, putting up a fight, but what choice does he have? So he jumps in, says a prayer to the great Tambor, and dives in. It's odd that Marvel would pray to Tambor, a pagan god of Kreelar's frozen wastelands. During the first Supreme War saga, Marvel destroyed a massive magnetic idol to Tambor. Marvel has entered the stone. He describes it like sliding down fresh green ice, one of Hala's chromium hills, or being a fish in the ocean currents. Marvel is supported by the gym's solid structure, but can somehow move through it at the same time. A distant glow catches Marvel's attention. As he turns that direction, he runs into a barrier. Through it, he can see a distorted version of Rick's face. Marvel blames Rick's madness for the barrier, not realizing that the madness affects them both. Rick suddenly wakes up, but he feels like somebody is beating him up. He sees Marvel in front of himself, but then he's unsure if it might be his own reflection. Marvel and Rick, instead of being pushed apart, are growing closer together. Marvel attempts to stop the merging by striking out, punching the barrier in front of him. In return, Rick catches the brunt of the blow. Rick, having been thrust into this before waking up, wonders if Marvel is trying to kill him. One thing he's sure of, none of this is real. Just like that time with the vitamins. What he means to say is that time Rick dropped acid in the negative zone, resulting in the current mind meld situation. Rick doesn't even think he's in his real body. As he walks forward, things do begin to resemble an acid trip and the rules of reality begin to fall apart. Except in Rick's head, where everything comes down to two people. Rick and Marvel. Rick knows that the two of them can't continue like this. He's being swallowed by whatever process is happening between the two of them. Rick sees one way out. One of them has to go. Permanently. On the surface of the planet, the cyborgs face off against the Noltrons once more. But this time they put forth a curious battle cry. One of us has to go. Permanently. Meanwhile, the head is given a progress report from his underground chamber. The people are rallying, and their two great generals inside the gym have begun formulating their battle strategy, implying that whatever takes place with Rick and Marvel will have a direct effect on the battlefield. The head states that at last they will be free of the eternal war. The cyborg soldier standing nearby wants to make certain what the head means by that. After all, the soldier takes pride in being the most organic cyborg of the bunch. The head lets Rambu know that his pride is a nuisance. Rambu takes umbrage with that. He thought the entire reason they were here was to fight for life against the Kree death devices. The head corrects him. They were sent here to win or die. Cyborg soldiers are considered expendable troops in a much larger war. Rambu counters... It was he who found the gym, and after finding it, the head promised all of them a better life. A life where they wouldn't have to keep losing limbs, keep watching themselves get turned into machines piece by piece. Head claims that's still the plan. He's using the energy of Marvel and Rick's battle for their minds transmuted onto the battlefield, and I'm still not certain how this is supposed to work, but it's an infinity stone, so whatever. Deep behind the front line, Supremor watches from Hala, noting that finding the stone was more than a bit fortunate. It was part of his grand scheme. The great tapestry of manipulation Supremor has set into motion. Of note, Supremor refers to Rick Jones as though it would be a Cree name. Very nice touch. Supremor, in the middle of soapboxing, cuts himself off to ask of an underling, Bundal is lingering in his presence. No, not at all. He's just there to adjust Supremor's port of view. But Bundal does have some observations he'd like to share. He sees a potential flaw in the plan. What if Marvel and Rick Jones kill each other? Supremor isn't worried. He only needs the mind of the winner. Bundal is 
still worried. After all, their journey was rough and treacherous. Again, Supremor isn't concerned. He increased the power of the Noltrons on Deneb 4 just to heighten the danger and terror in the region. Bundal is left confused, so he comes right out and asks it. What is your plan? But as one might expect, that is a step too far, and Bundal is dismissed. As he leaves, he couldn't help but feel that the Supreme Intelligence has underestimated the power he unleashes, and worries that there may be forces to which Supremor is unaware. Rambu has pulled up what's going on inside the Infinity Stone on a monitor and wants to know which of the two combatants will win and thus win their war for them. Head gives a less than satisfactory answer. It doesn't matter. As long as one side wins, the war will be over, thus bringing about the peace that Head promised. We get the expected reaction from Rambu, who doesn't understand how Head could ever say such things. Head explains it's because he is between two worlds. He's attached to two bodies. One used to be all flesh, and then cyborg, and now something in between. But he's still a cyborg, and he's been fighting alongside other cyborgs, and he was saved by his cyborg friends, and the Noltrons are going to kill you if they win, so... Head explains that in all things, he sees both sides. When looking at the war, he sees one side's cause as clearly as the other, and lacks the ability to choose one over the other. <laughs> wow. Bad time for a uh, both sides argument. So, instead of choosing who will win, he's letting Marvel and Rick battle it out, and whatever happens, happens. And Head effectively stops working for the resistance. Once I fought for our side, Rambu, today, I do not fight at all. Rambu is angry, and rightfully so. We trusted you. We thought you would devise a plan for victory. Instead, the head betrayed them. Rambu calls him out for becoming exactly what the cyborgs are fighting against. To become a two-sided, massive... But Head seems done with Rambu and pulls rank. And I'm not a general, he says as he strikes Rambu. As crazy as things are outside the gym, they are even crazier inside. Marvel finds a way past the barrier, and doing so feels like a blow to Rick. In turn, Rick breaks down one of Marvel's walls. After doing so, he remarks that it must be barriers from their minds. It's not a battle of superheroes, but a war of super egos. Marvel has come to the same conclusion. If Rick wins, Marvel will become a pawn in his own mind forever. Marvel is ready to beat Rick now and forever, and at the same time, a giant beast shows up before Rick. Marvel has used his cosmic awareness to summon a giant space monster. Rick gets back at Marvel by drawing strength from the Negaband, strength that is pulled out of Marvel. Back on Daneb 4, for the Noltrons and Cyborgs, it's all-out war, until suddenly... Both cyborgs and Noltrons stop in their tracks. Elsewhere, the battle pauses as both parties consider the stakes. Rick and Marvel have constantly argued with each other against their situation, but never before has it come to blows. As they flail out with wild attacks, each feels the pain the other imparts upon the other, and thus must think of other ways to battle. The cyborgs on the battlefield wonder about the paws and why they are no longer fighting. But down below, their general knows the reason, knowing another assault will follow. While he watches the gym, he doesn't see Rambu pull himself to his feet, and neither Head nor Rambu notice his fawn hiding in the shadows. The next assault comes, but oddly, it doesn't appear to be from either Rick or Marvel. Although each is likely to blame the other, Marvel remarks that this attack feels different. Outside, both cyborgs and Noltrons both totter from the blow as the Noltrons worry that the planet itself may be disintegrating. But it isn't the planet, it's the Infinity Stone. Rambu pounds his fist upon it, cursing the day he brought it to the general. I think Rambu is a attempting to destroy the gem in order to fulfill his duty, 
and suddenly he loses any and all focus on the task at hand because female, thanks to everybody on Daneb Forg being cyborgs, it's probably been a long, long time since Rambu has seen that much female skin in one place. She tells Rambu that she's come to help. She introduces herself. Rick Jones calls me Fawn. She explains that she wants to save Rick Jones and thus the cause of the cyborgs, which means that Marvel is fighting for the Nultrons. Fawn explains that since her substance isn't of this universe, that she needs Rambu's assistance to get inside the gym. Rambu reaches out his hand and they dive forth. The head cries out in alarm, but it's too late. Marvel has guessed that some other force is involved here. That last blow wasn't from Rick, and if that's the case, he needs to wrap things up quick. But before he can escape, he and Rick have to have their final battle. Rick sees Marvel coming, but Rick is ready. This will be the end, the final showdown. As Rick struggles forward, he notes that there are chains everywhere holding him back, almost as if he and Marvel were holding themselves back. Rick lets go and it's on. Marvel and Rick die forth, man to man. Both men are determined to exit the ring as the victor. Marvel is ready to be ready, to be whole, to be one. But Rick? Rick isn't going to give up after coming so far. And then, in a flash of color, Rambu and Fawn have arrived. Fawn thinks Rambu, afraid that they might have arrived too late. Both men have broken through to their primal cores. Both men draw upon the same power to fight each other. In the process, both men continue to become closer and closer and further entwined. This could lead to their death. And if Rick Jones dies, Fawn dies. Say, say what? Looks like Rick Jones heard that as well. It's enough of a break for Rambu to step in and force the two men apart. As he does so, he exclaims that the female must survive, but Rick is ready to finish the fight. Fawn walks over and touches Rick's head, telling him to listen. She does the same to Marvel, noting that now that his mind is more open, he too can listen. Fawn points out that their obsession with beating each other is irrational. If either one of them wins, the other will be poorer for it. She points out that yes, both men have changed, and as long as they continue living, they will continue to change. But life is always preferable to death. The two don't have to merge unless they want to. What they need to do is to learn to use their own abilities instead of letting those abilities be the boss of them. Marvel admits that the general might have tricked him and wants to know who the girl is, but Rick, noting that Marvel could never see her before, shrugs his shoulders and feigns ignorance. Rick at least knows her name. He, he could at least answer that much of Marvel's question. Fawn takes Rick's hand, starting a chain whereby she leads the men out of the gym and into the final issue of this story arc, where we are promised a confrontation with the Supreme Intelligence. Issue 46. From the prologue panel, this would be the bloom. One of the things I don't like about them skipping between issues here is they fail to show Rick and Marvel emerging from the gym. The entire plot with the Noltrons and Cyborgs is seemingly dropped as the next issue begins with Rick, Marvel, Fawn, and Rambu soaring through space somewhere over Daneb 4. Interestingly, we are told here that Fawn is a gaiman, whatever that means. These four don't know it, but the fate of a world hangs in the balance. I am very much uncertain as to how much time has passed, as we're told that uh, the four are approaching Hala's Rings of Protection. As they do so, they run across the Star of Vengeance, an Imperial Dreadnought, Kree Star-class battlecruiser, the very same ship Marvel served aboard as a lieutenant for two years, and the deadliest warship in the Kree Starfleet. 
Marvel is flabbergasted, unsure why the Supreme Intelligence would go for so much overkill. Sending out the vengeance is like sending an elephant to squash a mosquito. The Supreme Intelligence can read Marvel's thoughts and lets us know that this is but a single stage of his plan. Isn't it always? Supremor announces that Rick and Marvel have entered the final phase of his plan, even if Supremor wasn't expecting them to have Rambu with them. Of note, Supremor doesn't appear to be aware of Fawn. This is reinforced in the next panel when he refers to them as U3. While they watch the Dreadnought approach, Supremor is going to make his move. Supremor looks back at the previous events of this arc, noting that Marvel never made a move that wasn't first planned and set into motion by Supremor. From his fight with the Stranger, to his defeat of Drax, to his psychic battle with Rick Jones, to the finale of the Millennia Bloom, a flower first mentioned by the Prospector in issue 42. The battleship has finished its approach. Marvel waves for Rick to move in, preparing for a battle, but before they make a move, Marvel and Rick are taken away by an incoming beam. As for where they both end up, well, we'll look at Marvel first. Marvel, for the second time this story arc, calls out to Tambor as he enters the Supreme Intelligence's chamber. In the room, ready for battle, is a physical manifestation of Supremor. He looks to Marvel, claiming to be the ultimate Kree and therefore the ultimate warrior. Marvel says he thought this was no more than a legend, a phantom used to frighten children. I can't help but think that this is a throwback to the original Supremor saga in Captain Marvel Volume 1, Issue Number 16, when Super Sentry arrives and Marvel said then, The Super Sentry, I had thought him but a legend, a fairy tale for all Kree youth. A very nice and respectable nod to existing canon. Supremor tells Marvel that every legend has a basis in fact and that his is as real as the Millennia Bloom. But Marvel has had enough talk of flowers. He wants to know what happened to Rick Jones. Supremor tells him to worry not. He'll never see Rick alive again. Marvel calls his one-time master a butcher while striking him with his fist, noting that once he revered Supremor like a god. As Marvel continues to land blows, Supremor points out that Marvel still serves him. He just knows not how. Marvel answers with a resounding, never. He then redoubles his efforts, telling Supremor that if he can't hurt him, the least he can do is make him wish he'd never been born. And as I turn the page, I want to show off the similarities between these two panels side by side. Fun stuff, how they match up, and this has been an artistic device we've seen Milgram use several times across this arc. Anyway, Rick Jones is also facing off against a physical manifestation of Supremor, only instead of being on the planet Hala, he's somewhere on the Star of Vengeance. Supremor's opening dialogue is almost word for word what he says to Marvel, but with the names swapped. Rick isn't down for as much talk as Marvel and dives right into the action, accusing Supremor of killing his friend. Rick is told Marvel isn't dead yet. He may decide to kill Rick instead, depending on his mood. And as he says this, he backhands Rick across the room. Rick picks himself up, wiping his lip and calling it a lucky punch. As Rick flies back in, Supremor proves it wasn't a lucky punch by landing a second. This one sends Rick through a nearby wall. If not for the Negabands, Rick would be dead. But now he's got other problems as he's surrounded by Kree crewmen. Meanwhile, Marvel is having no problem beating up his version of Supremor, who is literally laughing at his own defeat. Marvel wonders why, while above the planet, the Supremor attacking Rick remains super strong, backhanding Rick through the air once more. Marvel can feel the answer to the puzzle, staring him in the face, while Supremor chides that he'll never figure it out in time. In fact, it may already be too late. Rick has had enough of being a punching bag. His negaband isn't providing as much help as he would like. 
So this time he's going to concentrate all of his willpower on it, and in true Captain Marvel fashion, Rick lets loose his companion's signature two-handed arm-swinging punch with everything he's got. As he does so, Marvel becomes as weak as a kitten, and Supremor takes advantage of the situation, striking our hero hard. He then grabs Marvel by the neck and begins choking him out. There is a schedule to keep, and Supremor needs this battle to end now. Marvel collapses to the ground as Supremor straddles on top of him. Marvel tests the Negaban, but there is nothing left. All he has left to fight with is his normal strength, and that will have to do, as he strikes Supremor hard enough to end the chokehold and push him off the top of Marvel's body. In the corner of the chamber, unseen, a once-in-millennium event begins unnoticed by our combatants. Rick must be pulling from the Negabands a little, otherwise I see no possible way he could clear his way through four Kree at once on his way to Supremor. Once Rick gets face to face with Supremor, he realizes that old Boogerhead is laughing at him. Meanwhile, Marvel's Supremor is pleased to finally face off against a worthy foe. Things don't look good for Marvel. He's being crushed with the force of a neutron star by Supremor's mass intensifier beam. Something has to give. This time, it's the floor. Supremor stands triumphant, bragging that it's a Terran mile to the bottom. Luckily for Marvel, his negabands are working once more. This allows him to rise up from the floor for a counterattack. As Marvel fights, he attempts to suss out the situation. He assumed Rick was captive or worse, but his cosmic awareness would have tuned him into that by now. And then, Marvel has a thought flash through his head. What if he and Rick are both fighting Supremors? Doing so would set up one infinite force against the other. This could create a situation where the only way to defeat either Supremor was to use the full force of the Negabands. Only if either Rick or himself were to do that, the other would die. Marvel stops to salute his opponent spelling out the same plan he just uncovered again, only this time out loud to his opponent. He sees the no-win situation they are in and has concluded that either way, Supremor wins. But there are still a couple of wild cards out on the table that Supremor didn't account for. And Marvel, he doesn't know about them yet. He's already accepted that he's locked into a hopeless battle. Once inside the Kree ship, Rambu wants to know how Fawn expects to find their companions on a ship this size. She explains that she can feel Rick, while the reader can see Supremor at the end of the tunnel. Fawn and Rambu go to the light at the end of the tunnel, but they don't find anything good. Rick is being beset upon from all sides by Kree weaponry. Fawn can feel Rick's pain, and it's destroying her. Fawn claims that she can help Rick Jones, but she needs time. Rambu flies into action, offering to buy Fawn the time she needs. Fawn steps forth, following Rambu's lead. As she sees it, if a cyborg is willing to give his life, then why shouldn't she, who is no more than a dream, be willing to do the same? And Supremor is struck by a powerful unseen force equal to his own. Rick sees Fawn and calls out for her to leave before she gets hurt. Supremor watches intrigued, thinking at first that Rick might be going mad, but then considers other explanations. He thinks back to the Kree Scroll War when Rick used the Destiny Force to create the Golden Age superheroes of his youth to defend Supremor from Ronin and his minions. Supremor strikes, and upon striking, sees Rick's companion. This time, Rick has used the Destiny Force of his mind to create the ideal woman, one that Rick can literally fawn over. Rick sees the blast strike her and calls out, clutching at his heart. Fawn apologizes for failing Rick, but Rick is ready to use his power to give her life. She insists that he can't. He's too drained from the battle with nothing left for her. She wipes away a tear from Rick's face and passes away in Rick's arms, but Man, that does raise some interesting questions. Could Rick Jones have really have really made her real? 
After that little dose of drama, we switch back over to Marvel, whose mind is being flooded with images of Rick and Fawn and death. Rick's grief distracts Marvel from the battle just enough for Supremor to get in a solid attack. He lifts Marvel over his head, clutching his leg and neck. Marvel can't do anything to stop Supremor as he brings Marvel down, cracking his spine over his knee. Supremor assumes he is one and gloats over our heroes, going as far as to say he thinks Rick's wildcard female mind creation ended up working out in his favor. After all, she was what finally broke Rick, and Rick's grief provided Supremor the opportunity to come in at Marvel there at the end. In the end, Supremor has achieved his desired results. Both heroes are beaten, and both of their minds are ravaged. All of this timed out and taking place so that Rick and Marvel could be here in this moment in their current state so that the two of them would be vulnerable to the siren song of the millennia bloom. Once the flower blooms, its song will reach deep into the core of their beings, consuming them and expunging everything that makes them unique individuals. In their place will be two soulless husks, which Supremor can use as he sees fit. Supremor is going to use Rick, Marvel, and the power they possess as his ultimate weapons, both serving him, completely loyal and totally ruthless. First order of business, destroy Earth, the entire planet. And also Supremor can be in possession of the sole source of Destiny Force, with a conduit which has proved that it can tap into the power on at least two occasions. But such power is inherent in every Earthling, so leaving an entire planet of such creatures is far too dangerous. Once Earth is out of the way, the Kree can once more pursue their goal of universal conquest without having to worry about the constant interference of Earth's superheroes such as the Avengers, the Inhumans, X-Men, and Fantastic Four. In Supremor's eyes, an ideal solution. And here it comes. The Millennium Flower is starting to bloom. The time is almost upon us, but that scrappy Earth kid Rick Jones isn't ready to throw in the towel just yet. He's already lost Fawn, and he's heard Supremor's plan to murder all of his superhero buddies back on Earth. Well, Rick Jones raises his head and says, No way, Supremor. If Supremor wants Earth, he's gonna have to kill Rick Jones first. Rick dives into the battle with a powerful kick. Supremor calls Rick a fool pointing out that he controls an empire. He can squash Rick like an insect. Rick tells him to do it, because right now it's all or nothing. Rick continues to land blow after blow in a mix of kicks and punches, which Supremor has underestimated Rick's resiliency. In order to compensate, he moves power from Marvel Supremor to Rick Supremor in order to hold off Rick until the flower blooms. As long as Marvel is unconscious, it's all good. But what if Marvel wasn't unconscious? Marvel raises his head and starts to rise to his feet. Marvel is determined to fight off Supremor using his natural strength alone. Marvel flies in and lands a solid blow on Supremor. Marvel knows he doesn't have a chance of winning the battle, but he hopes he can keep it going long enough that Rick can win. Both heroes continue fighting, hoping that the other will pull through knowing that if they fail, the Kree will spread unending war across the entire universe. And then it happens. The flower blooms. Supremor says, Too late, Captain. Your time is up. Supremor takes a moment to relish in his victory. Now that the flower has bloomed, within seconds, Marvel will be no more than a shriveled husk. Marvel has to act fast. He calls out to Rick, telling him to go to the bridge. Rick takes Supremor to the ground and makes his escape. As he does so, Marvel instructs Rick to get to the missile control console. Rick is on his way. Supremor again can hear Marvel's thoughts, and upon hearing his instructions, calls Marvel a madman, one who would destroy all of Hala. Rick Jones makes a really good point. Isn't that what you had in mind for Earth? And then Rick hits the shiny red button. 
asking if Supremor has any last words? Just one long no. The Creed's greatest warship unleashes its payload of blasters and antimatter nuclear missiles. Rick fired all of those directly in Zahala's sun. There is a full minute's wait for detonation. I really wish they would have shown us what took place in those 60 seconds, because once those 60 seconds are over, the sun's reaction is immediate, pushing forth a massive sun flare. Energy arcs forth from the sun, striking Hala until its shields glow as bright as a newborn star. Eventually, the planet itself fades from view, lost in the vastness of the terrifying light. Later, the sun rises over Kreelar. Something that came close to never happening again, but something is different now about the planet-wide city. The sounds of the Kree and their machines have gone silent. No, they aren't dead, only unconscious. Inside the Supreme Intelligence's audience chamber, the only sound is the giant screen's background static. For the first time in recorded history, his screen is blank. As for Captain Marvel, he's laid out on the floor of his chamber. But Rick Jones and the Earth are safe, and Rick Jones comes knocking through a wall. Rick isn't aware of the victory and is looking for a fight. He comes in ready to face off against the Supreme Intelligence and is surprised to find a blink screen. Then he sees Marvel, his friend, laid out on the floor. After losing Fawn, Rick isn't ready to let go of Marvel. Not yet. Rick wises up pretty fast, noting that if Marvel was dead, he would know it, thanks to their shared brains. He checks Marvel's pulse. It's faint, but fading. Rick, still kicking himself over losing Fawn, decides to use the Nega Bands to share his life force to recharge Marvel. As Rick exchanges the energies, Marvel starts to make noise. Both partners are happy to see the other alive. Rick wants to know what happened. Marvel explains that Supremor was forced to subvert all of his power to the planetary shields. Doing so overloaded and short-circuited every person and machine on Hala. Everything will eventually recover, but it's going to take some time. Rick lets Marvel know that Vaughn didn't make it. Wow, he is torn up about losing the imaginary friend he created to Fawn over. Even so, Marvel is sympathetic. As Marvel stares across the city, he remarks on the peace and quiet, on how there hasn't been a day like this on Hala in centuries. I'll agree with him on that one, Marvel fans. Even though this used to be Marvel's home, he wants to hear a bird sing or a child laugh. He feels torn. Bird songs are very un-Cree, and Cree children, they never laugh. Marvel has to admit something. Both he and Rick put losses on the board today. Rick lost a woman, but Marvel lost a world. Rick wants to know what they should do next. And with the comic title being handed off to a new writer, really a continuous revolving door of writers moving forward. Anyway, Marvel suggests that they go back to Earth. Let's go home. And wow, Marvel now feels more at home on Earth than on Hala. I have to say I really like how this story wrapped up. In many ways, it encompasses the whole of Marvel's relationship with Rick. Marvel's relationship with his homeworld, letting us see Marvel and Rick working together as a team. We get to see Rick fulfill his dreams of having superpowers. Rick falls in love and loses the girl again. The freaking Mind Stone Infinity Gem shows up, and Marvel and Rick take a swim inside of it, and the last we saw of it, it was still in possession of the head. And that happened, a cyborg head attached to a giant floating mechanical life-raising death machine that also looks like a head. There was Ronin and Zarek come back, Drax the Destroyer is in here, Thanos has come back, this story covers so many bases. This arc doesn't get the credit of the original Supreme War Saga, or the Kree Scroll War, or the Thanos War, but I'm going to go out and say it, as far as staying true to canon and building on existing mythology, this story deserves to stand right along with each one of those other stories. Between this story arc and the Trial of the Watcher story arc, I have to give props to Steve Englehart and Al Milgram on 
really digging in deep into Marvel's history and writing meaningful stories that built upon the character. Even their one-off standalone issue with Una forced Marvel to face his past once more. And in doing so, both writers did so much more to move the character forward. These two did a great job of humanizing the characters, making you feel for both Rick and Marvel. These two writers show a great, deep character story while building upon all of those stories that came before them. Moving forward after this, I feel things are a little more hit and miss. And many of those writers choose to outright ignore the top-notch work put into these characters. In the next episode of Captain Marvel, we continue diving into Hanging Chad plots, and I love it. Century 459 returns. Thanks for watching. Feel free to hit any of the buttons below. I'm out.